Hey guys, so musicians generally work in the evenings. This was no different in the 1930s or 40s. Swing musicians of the era would start work in clubs and ballrooms in the evening when people would go out for some after work entertainment. But when audiences left the clubs and went back home to bed, the swing musicians instead went to jam sessions. The most famous of these was Minton's Playhouse, which opened in New York City in 1940. It is said that this is where bebop was born. The house band included drummer Kenny Clark and pianist Thelonious Monk. And the musicians that jammed there included jazz greats like Ben Webster, Charlie Christian, Dizzy Gillespie, Bud Powell, and Charlie Parker. These jam sessions were for serious musicians and involved a lot of experimentation. And it quickly became quite competitive. Musicians would test each other's abilities and skills by intentionally making the songs difficult to play. They would pick a standard song like I Got Rhythm, but play it incredibly fast using complex chord substitutions and transpose the song up one semitone after every repeat. This would very quickly root out any amateur musicians. In fact, when Charlie Parker attended his first few jam sessions, he couldn't keep up and completely stuffed up his soloing, and in fact was kicked out of the jam session for being incapable and incompetent. This humiliation inspired him to go home and practice 16 hours a day until he was a virtuoso. These jam sessions is where bebop was developed and perfected. Many people speak of bebop as a revolution in jazz, one that completely broke with the past. This isn't true. Bebop grew organically out of swing and shares many of its elements and features. As I just explained, bebop developed naturally in jam sessions. But one of the reasons people believe bebop was a break with the past is due to an accident of history. Bebop developed in the early 1940s, with the first recordings of bebop appearing in late 1944 and early 1945. Now, unfortunately, there was a musician's strike which prevented all unionized musicians from recording albums between 1942 and 1944 in the US. Consequently, there are no recordings of early bebop as it was first developing. So then, by the time bebop was heard for the first time on record, it had already grown and developed for over two years. Now, as I said before, numerous elements of bebop could be found in swing. Art Tatum used complex harmonies and chord substitutions. Count Basie began comping with the piano rather than just playing stride piano or a walking bass line. Coleman Hawkins improvised vertically over songs like Body and Soul, outlining the chord progression with arpeggios, but adding lots of chromatic passing notes. And Duke Ellington was a master at using dissonant chord voicings. But bebop took all of these elements to the extreme. Before bebop, if you wanted to improvise, you could get away with knowing little music theory and largely just feeling your way through the song using your ear to find what sounds good. With bebop, however, feeling was not enough. You had to know and understand. So now let's take a closer look at a comparison between swing music and bebop. So as I just said, bebop grew out of swing music. But whereas swing music was dance music, Bebop was art music or listening music, where the musicians showed off their virtuosity and talents and really pushed their limits. Now, there were a number of important instrumental changes. In swing music, the drummer kept the beat with a bass drum, whereas in bebop, the drummer kept the beat with a ride cymbal and used the bass drum to create fills. This was known as dropping bombs, which was a World War II reference, which is appropriate given when bebop came about. In swing music, the pianist mostly played stride piano um, and generally just played the harmony. Whereas in bebop, the pianist comped, so inserted interesting rhythmic patterns into the chords. He also used shell voicings in a low register, often just root seventh or root third. 
This is now often known as Bud Powell voicings. And the piano left the rhythm section and also became a soloing instrument, so that the right hand of the pianist was playing pretty complex improvisational lines. Now this was quite a change because in swing music, the piano was very firmly rooted in the rhythm section and very rarely soloed. The guitar in swing music generally just strummed the chords on the beat. Whereas in bebop, if there was a guitarist, they would play single melody lines on electric guitar so that it was amplified and can be, could be heard over the rest of the band. The bass, however, continued doing the same thing. Walking bass line in swing music and walking bass line in bebop. Swing music was generally played with a big band and focused on the overall feel or groove of the song. Whereas bebop was played in smaller groups, usually trios, quartets or quintets, and generally focused on individual virtuosity. It was all about the soloist, not creating a feel or a groove to the song. In terms of soloing, swing musicians improvised vertically. That is, they would play up and down arpeggios, usually just of the seventh chords or maybe the natural ninth. The phrases they created were very warm and lyrical and largely diatonic. In bebop, while the improvisation was still vertical, so the soloists still thought in terms of chords and chord progressions, and so still arpeggiated chords, they also arpeggiated up to the 9th, 11th and 13th, including altered 9ths or altered 11ths or altered 13ths. So maybe arpeggiating a C7 chord, but instead of finishing on the 7th or the root, you'd keep going to hit, say, a flat 9, a sharp 11 and a flat 13. So it's the same general idea, you're still arpeggiating the chords as you move through the chord progression, but you're now using a lot more tensions, a lot more ninths, elevenths and thirteenths to create more tension. Bebop musicians also superimposed new chords over the existing chord progression. So they could, for example, arpeggiate an F minor triad over an E flat 7 chord. So almost outlining a completely different chord or chord progression. Now that obviously created a lot of tension, but they did use this idea of superimposition quite a lot. The solo was incredibly fast with short notes and so it was largely vibratoless. And bebop soloists used more exotic scales like diminished scales and whole tone scales and things of the like. As well as diatonic scales with passing notes which incidentally became known as bebop scales. They generally improvised in swung eighth notes with occasional triplets or ornamentals. And they very often started phrases off the beat. In terms of the harmony, swing music generally stuck to seventh chords or again maybe with a natural ninth occasionally. Whereas bebop harmony was quite complex. This is where the complex jazz harmony that we all know really began to flourish. So bebop harmony used a lot of extensions and alterations that have flat fives or flat nines. They, use, they would use lots of altered dominance and lots of tritone substitutions. They really loved to use tritone substitutions. And whereas swing chord progressions were quite diatonic using a lot of 2-5-1s, bebop, while still retaining many 2-5-1s, um, made the chord progression much more chromatic, again by using those chord substitutions or just using approach chords or neighbouring chords, things of that nature. Rhythmically, swing music is even and predictable and used a mix of short and long duration notes. Whereas bebop used complex and quasi unpredictable accents and rhythms and very short duration notes. Melodically, swing music used a lot of repetition, it created smooth and lyrical themes, it very clearly outlined the chords, it was regular, symmetrical, though with some syncopation. But it was still very easy to sing and follow. It had lots of musical cues so that you knew where you were up to in the chord progression or in the song. Whereas bebop melodies had limited melodic cues, very little repetition, and didn't really have um, themes or motifs in the same um, explicit way that swing music did. Melodies and melodic phrases became much more improvisational and full of passing notes that really flew by quickly. 
Their melodies were complex and angular and dissonant and serpentine and syncopated and irregular and asymmetrical. But it nevertheless had a relatively predictable melodic contour. Phrases still typically went up and then came back down and finished. And though the melody and improvisations still outlined the harmony, it was less obviously outlined because of their use of ninths, elevenths, and thirteenths. And all this, of course, made bebop melodies very difficult to sing and difficult to follow. A few other differences are that swing music was largely arranged, whereas bebop was largely improvised. Swing music was generally played in a slow or medium tempo, whereas bebop was very fast and full of notes and sounded quite chaotic. And whereas in swing music, the rhythm section was really there to just keep the beat and play the chords, in bebop, the rhythm section became much more interactive and responded to the soloist. So if the soloist you know, started playing fast or started playing a particular uh, motif or repeated phrase, the uh, rhythm section could interact and maybe play the same phrase or play in a different register or you know, stop playing completely and let the soloist really just take over a period of silence. But the idea was that the rhythm section really interacted with the soloist a lot more in bebop than in swing. Now the classic bebop melody or improvisational line would arpeggiate a chord up to an available tension then walk down a scale using a few chromatic passing notes and then finish with a downward motion. Bum, bum. Now the arpeggiated chord would often start on the third and go up to a flat ninth. That was very common. Then they would use what we now call a bebop scale to go down. But essentially what that means is using a diatonic scale with at least one passing note. And then, like I said, they'd finish with a downward movement. And this is, in fact, where the name bebop comes from. This little descending two-note ending um, sounds like someone going bebop, bebop. And thus, we got the name for a whole genre. Now, of course, you will find descending arpeggios and ascending scale runs in various bebop tunes. But as a generalization, um, this is pretty accurate. Arpeggio up to an available tension and then bebop scale down. Now a good example of all of this that I've just covered is the jazz standard Donnelly and that goes as follows. that that was quite fast and complex and dissonant and asymmetrical and angular. And that's what bebop's all about. There are no clear musical cues. You can't really pinpoint, you know, oh, there's the A section, or there's the B section, or there's that melodic motif again. It's intentionally quite irregular and quite asymmetrical. Looking through just the first half of Donnelly, you'll notice that all the phrases finish moving down, descending just like we discussed with that bebop sound or feel. In bars 1 and 2, we simply walk down the F bebop dominant scale, which, for those of you who don't know, is essentially just a diatonic scale or the mixolydian mode, technically, with a passing note. And in bar 3, we simply arpeggiate up that B flat 7 chord, but we arpeggiate from the 3rd to the 9th. Then in bar 5, following that little... Um, chromatic sounding pickup, we simply arpeggiate all the way up the B flat minor 7 chord all the way up to the 11th. So really that entire bar is just one big arpeggio, but not stopping on the 7th, going all the way up to the 11th. 
but it doesn't really sound like that when you listen to the melody. It doesn't sound like we're simply um, arpeggiating a chord. It still sounds quite interesting and dissonant and complex. That's partly because it's played quite fast and partly because we begin the arpeggio on beat 2 rather than beat 1. And because that arpeggio is preceded by those two notes, which happen to form a tritone, which was very often used in bebop. Bebop musicians love tritones. They would use tritone substitution, they would use tritones in their melodies and their improvisations, this being an example. In bar 6 over the E flat 7 chord, we've played a F minor triad. So we've superimposed a new chord over that E flat 7 chord. In bar 7, we've simply arpeggiated the A flat major 7 chord from the 3rd all the way up to the 9th, then back down to the root. In bar 8, we've arpeggiated up the E flat minor 7 chord from the root all the way up to the 9th. In bars 10 and 11, we simply walk down and up um, a scale with a few chromatic passing notes. And in bar 12, we arpeggiate up an F7 chord from the 3rd all the way up to the root, before descending down a scale with a couple little bumps in uh, bars 13 and 14. Then finally, in bars 15 and 16, we're essentially just playing broken chords which finish with a little triplet and descending scale. So as you can see, a good portion of that melody um, in the first half of the song is essentially just arpeggios. But the way they play them, the speed, the fact that they start on off beats or on beat two rather than on beat one, the fact that they start on thirds rather than roots and end on ninths or elevenths rather than roots or thirds, makes the arpeggios sound a bit more dissonant and interesting and not give away the chord progression too clearly. Even though the melody is quite clearly following the chord progression, it sounds much more complex than that. It doesn't give obvious harmonic cues. Cool, so hopefully that gave you a nice little overview of bebop, a great subgenre of jazz, um, and really the quintessential subgenre of jazz and where modern jazz started. A lot of the, the ideas and concepts in jazz, like tritone substitution, really originate um, and blossomed and flourished during the bebop years. So go have a listen to a few bebop musicians. I've put a list of some up here in the picture-in-picture, picture, and hear the pros do it. And enjoy. Embrace that dissonance. Cool. And so thanks for watching, guys, and see you next time. Bye.